thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I am Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla uh, on things like WebAssembly, which is what I'll be talking about today. And I'm joined by Till Schneiderite, who leads our WebAssembly tooling efforts, and he'll be filling us in on some of their work. So first off, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a way of running programming languages other than JavaScript on the web. Up until now, to run code on a web page, the only language you could use was JavaScript. But now that there's WebAssembly, you can use other languages, like C or C++ or Rust. I've noticed that some people have a misconception about WebAssembly, though. People think that the MVP that landed in browsers in 2017 is the final version of WebAssembly. And I can understand where that misconception comes from because the WebAssembly CG is really committed to backwards compatibility. So the WebAssembly that you write today will continue to work far into the future. But that doesn't mean that it's feature complete and that's far from the case in fact. Features are coming to WebAssembly which will fundamentally alter what you can do with WebAssembly. I think of these future features kind of like the skill tree in a video game. We fully filled in the top few of these skills, but there's still this whole skill tree underneath to unlock so that we can unlock all of these different applications. So let's look at what's been filled in already and then we can see what's yet to come. WebAssembly's story starts with Imscripten, which made it possible to bring large C and C++ code bases to the web for things like desktop applications and games. And it did this by transpiling that code to, to JavaScript. And at first, that JavaScript would run pretty slow. But then a Firefox engineer saw how you could add optimizations to the JS engine to make it run fast. And that gave us Asm.js. Once the other browser vendors saw how fast Asm.js was, they started adding the same optimizations to their engines as well. But that wasn't the end of the story. It was just the beginning. Engines could still make this go faster. But they couldn't do it in JavaScript itself. Instead, they needed a new language, one that was designed specifically to be compiled to, and that was WebAssembly. So what were the skills needed for this MVP, this minimum viable product running C and C++ on the web? WebAssembly's designers knew that eventually they would want to support languages other than just C and C++, so they needed a language agnostic compile target, something like the assembly language that things like desktop applications are compiled to, like x86. But this assembly language wouldn't be for an actual physical machine, it would be for a conceptual machine. That compiler target had to run very fast to meet users' expectations for smooth interactions and gameplay, and it also needed to load fast, because the web's users are used to pretty fast load times. But these kinds of applications are very large code bases, which means that there's a lot to download when you first visit a URL. So we needed our compiler target to be compact, so it could go over the internet quickly. These languages also needed to manage memory differently from JavaScript. They needed to be able to directly manage their memory. And this is because languages like C and C++ have a low-level language feature called pointers. They, and pointers need to be able to take a memory address and read and write directly from that memory address. But you can't have a program that you downloaded from the web just accessing your memory willy-nilly. In order to provide a way to access memory like a native program is used to, but to keep the browser secure, we had to create something that could give access to a very specific part of memory and nothing else. To do this, WebAssembly uses a linear memory model. And that's implemented using typed arrays, which are basically just JavaScript arrays, except the, the items that are in this array are bytes, bytes of memory. So when you're accessing it, you're just using array indexes, which you can treat as though they were memory addresses. And this means that you can pretend that this array is C++ memory. So with all of those things in place, you could run desktop applications and games in your browser as if they were running natively on your computer. And that was pretty much the skill set that WebAssembly had when it was released as an MVP. It truly was an MVP, a minimum viable product. This allowed certain kinds of applications to work, but there was still a whole host of other applications that needed to be unlocked. So the next achievement to unlock is heavier weight desktop applications. Can you imagine if something like Photoshop was running in your browser, if you could load it on any of your devices and start working with your files like you can with Gmail? We've already started seeing things like this. For example, the AutoCAD team has made their CAD software available through the browser, and Adobe has made Lightroom available through the browser using WebAssembly. 
But there are still a few features that we need to make sure all of these applications, even the heaviest of heavyweight applications, work well in the browser. First is support for multi-threading. Modern day computers have multiple cores that can process things in parallel. But to make use of these cores, you need support for threading. There's another bit of modern hardware that processes things in parallel, and that's SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. With SIMD, it's possible to take a chunk of memory and split it up across different execution units, which are basically like cores. And then you have the same bit of code, the same instruction, run across all of those execution units, but on different parts of the data. Another hardware capability is 64-bit addressing. Memory addresses are just numbers. So if your memory addresses are only 32 bits long, you only have so many memory addresses, enough for four gigabytes. But most modern hardware supports 64-bit addressing, which offers 16 exabytes of memory addresses. That's a big difference. Adding 64-bit support will take the artificial limitation on memory address space out of WebAssembly. But these applications don't just need to run fast. Load times need to be fast, too. One big step here is to do something called streaming compilation, where you compile the file as it's being downloaded. And WebAssembly was designed to enable this. A tiered compiler also helps. So in Firefox, we have two compilers. The first one, the baseline compiler, starts when the download starts for the first time. Um, then another compiler, the optimizing compiler, runs on several feds in the background. And that one takes longer to compile, but the code that it generates is extremely fast. We're also working on a new optimizing compiler called CraneLift, and CraneLift is designed to actually speed up that initial compile time. So it can compile code in parallel at a function by function level. But the code it generates is still fast, and we're currently working to see if we can make it generate code that's even faster when it's executing than our current optimizing compiler. But there's an even better trick we can use to skip compiling most of the time. Unlike with JavaScript, if you load the same WebAssembly file twice, it compiles to the same machine code. So we can store that compiled code in the HTTP cache. And then when the page is loading and it goes to check the cache, instead of pulling out that source code, it pulls out the compiled code. So this skips compiling completely. And there are ways to skip even more work, so stay tuned to see what else happens to improve load times. Where are we with supporting these heavyweight applications right now? For the threading, we have a proposal that's pretty much done, but a key piece of that, shared array buffers, had to be turned off in browsers earlier this year, last year. They will be turned, again, turned on again soon, though. SIMD is under active development at the moment. For WASM64, we have a good picture of how this is going to work, and that's pretty similar to how x86 or ARM got support for 64-bit addressing. And Firefox added streaming compilation last year. Uh, in Firefox, we actually compile the code so fast that it's basically done compiling by the time you've downloaded the file. And other browsers are adding streaming too. And we also added our baseline compiler last year, and other browsers have been adding the same kind of architecture. In Firefox, HTTP caching is close, and it is in, close in Chrome as well. And other improvements are in discussion. Even though this is all still in progress, heavyweight applications are still coming out today because WebAssembly already gives these applications the performance that they need. But once these features are all in place, there's going to be another achievement unlocked, and more of these heavyweight applications are going to be able to come to the browser. But WebAssembly isn't just for desktop applications. It's also meant for regular small modules de web development, the kind of web development that you're used to. If you have a module that does a lot of heavy computation or processing, that's a good use case for WebAssembly. And again, we're already seeing some of this. So the parser in the source maps library that's used in Webpack and Firefox DevTools, that was rewritten in Rust compiled to WebAssembly and is now 11 times faster. And the Gutenberg parser in WordPress is now an average of 86 times faster with its uh, rewrite in Rust compiled to WebAssembly. But for this to go mainstream, we need to have a few more things in place. First, calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly need to be fast. When WebAssembly first came out, these calls weren't fast because engines needed to optimize them. We finished our work in, on this in Firefox last summer, and now some of these calls are actually faster than non-inline JavaScript to JavaScript calls. That brings us to another thing, though. You often need to pass data between your JavaScript and WebAssembly functions. You need to pass arguments into your WebAssembly function or return values from it. 
At the moment, WebAssembly only, WebAssembly only understands numbers. So this means that you can't pass more complex things in like objects. You need to convert your object into numbers, put it in a linear memory, and then pull it back out on the WebAssembly side and, and figure out what it is. That's kind of complicated, and it takes some time to convert the data into linear memory. So we need this to be easier and faster. We also need to integrate with ES modules. Right now, you can't use import and export with WASM modules. But that means that the WebAssembly module isn't really part of the JS module graph. Just being able to import and export doesn't get us all the way there, though. We also need ways to distribute and bundle WebAssembly modules. What's the NPM for WebAssembly? Well, what about NPM? What's the Webpack or Parcel for WebAssembly? Well, what about Webpack and Parcel? These modules shouldn't look any different to the people that are using them, so why should we create a whole other ecosystem? And there's one more thing. Support for older versions of browsers, even those that don't know what WebAssembly is, like IE11. So where are we on all of these things? Well, calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly are fast in Firefox now, and other browsers are also prioritizing this. For easy and fast data exchange, there are a few proposals that will help with this, such as AnyRef, host bindings, and weak refs. And I unfortunately don't have time to go into the detail on that. Uh, but in the meantime, the Rust ecosystem has created tools that automate the handling of this stuff for you. For ES module integration, the proposal is pretty far along. For toolchain support, tools in the Rust ecosystem can package your code for NPM, and the bundlers are also actively working on support. And finally, for backwards compatibility, there's the WASM2JS tool. That takes a WASM file and spits out the equivalent JavaScript. Now, that JavaScript isn't going to be fast, but at least it will work in older versions of browsers that don't know what WebAssembly is. Once we unlock this achievement, we open the path to another two. Rewriting large parts of JavaScript frameworks in WebAssembly and making it possible for statically typed compiled to JavaScript languages to compile to WebAssembly instead. Languages like Scala.js or Reason or Elm. For both of these use cases, WebAssembly needs to support high-level language features. So first, let's look at rewriting parts of JS frameworks. For a framework like React, you could parallelize the virtual DOM diffing algorithm with a language that has really ergonomic support for parallelization, like Rust. And you could also speed things up by reducing memory usage and allocating memory differently. But you'd still need to interact with JavaScript objects, things like components, from that code. You can't just rewrite everything in linear memory, because that would be difficult and inefficient. So you need to be able to integrate with the browser's built-in garbage collector. And that will also help languages that compile to JavaScript, like Scala, JS, Reason, and Elm, because these languages, they already use JavaScript's garbage collector when they compile to JS. And that's the same GC that WebAssembly will be using when it's running in the browser. So they won't need to change their GC. We also need better support for handling exceptions, and we need good debugging support. Browsers today make it easy to debug your, your JavaScript using DevTools. We need that same kind of support for WebAssembly. And finally, for many functional languages, you need a feature called tail calls. So where are we on all of this? For garbage collection, our team already has a prototype of this working. Uh, but it will still take some time for these proposals to go through standardization, so we're probably looking at some time next year. Exception handling is still in the research and development phase. For debugging, there's currently some support in browser dev tools, but it's still not ideal. So there's a subgroup of the WebAssembly CG that is working on specifying that. And the tail calls proposal is also underway. Once those are all in place, we'll have unlocked JS frameworks and many compiled to JS languages. So those are all achievements that we can, can unlock inside of the browser. But what about outside the browser? Now, you may be confused when I talk about outside the browser. Because isn't the browser what you use to view the web? And isn't that right in the name, WebAssembly? But the truth is, technologies like HTML and CSS and JavaScript are only part of what makes the web. They're the visible part. They're what you use to make user interfaces, so they are the most obvious part. But there's another really important part of the web which has properties which aren't as visible. And this is the link. The link's innovation is that I can link to your page without having to put it in a central registry or ask you or even know who you are. It's this ease of linking that enabled us to create these global communities with people that we don't know. 
But there are two problems we haven't addressed if we just have this link. The first one is you go to, to visit the site and it delivers some code to you. How does it know what kind of code it should deliver to you? Because if you're running on a Mac, then you need to have a different kind of machine code than if you're running on Windows. Does a website need to have a different version of the code for every possible device? No. Instead, the site has one version of code, the source code, and that's what's delivered to the user. And that's translated to machine code on the user's device. The name for this concept is portability. With it, websites don't need to know what kind of device you're running. But that brings us to a second problem. If you don't know these people whose web pages you're visiting, how do you know what kind of code they're going to give to you? It could be trying to take over your system. Doesn't this vision of the web running code from anybody whose link you follow mean that you have to blindly trust anyone who's on the web? This is where the other key concept from the web comes in. And that's the security model. Basically, the browser takes the code and puts it in a sandbox. And it puts a couple of toys in that sandbox that uh, make it possible for the code to do some interesting things. But it leaves the dangerous toys outside of the sandbox. So the utility of the link is based on these two things. The portability, being able to deliver the same code to all these different devices and have it run. And the sandbox, the security model that lets you run the code without putting your machine at risk. So what difference does it make if you think of the web this way? It changes how you think of WebAssembly. You can think about WebAssembly as just another tool in the browser's toolbox, which it is, but it's not just that. WebAssembly also gives us a way to take these other two capabilities of the web, the portability and the security model, and bring them to use cases that need them too, outside of the web. We can expand the web past the boundaries of the browser. Now you may be thinking that already happened with Node.js. But as it is today, Node doesn't quite get us there. It doesn't give us full portability, and it doesn't give us the same security, the same ability to run untrusted code either. So JS modules, um, excuse me, with Node, it's possible to run JavaScript on servers and other devices that don't have a browser. So that does give us some portability. But you still need native modules in a lot of cases either because you need the code to run really fast, or you already have code written in a language like C that you want to then use in your app. But native modules aren't portable. They have to be compiled ahead of time specifically for the kind of device the user's using. We're also still missing security. Node could have taken the sandbox from the browser, but Node made the design decision early on that JS modules would have full access to certain system APIs. So JS modules can do things like write and read files on your machine. These capabilities, things like direct fi file access to your system, are the dangerous toys that aren't available in the browser sandbox. Even though they're dangerous though, for the kinds of use cases that Node was built for, these, these APIs do make a certain kind of sense. This kind of access makes a certain kind of sense. The thing I wanna make clear here is that Node made a choice really is that Node had a choice to make. For JS modules, it could have gone with a sandbox style approach. But for native modules, Node had less of a choice because it's really hard to sandbox native code. So Node has made this choice. Basically, if you're running a Node application today on your computer, you've basically said, I trust this code. Although the Node uh, developers are actually looking at a way that they can change this in the future. But despite this, WebAssembly can still help Node. It could eliminate most of the need for native modules, ones that are compiled ahead of time for the user's device. These could be written in WebAssembly instead and just compiled once. And these modules could then run across all devices, just like JavaScript modules do. The only problem here is that WebAssembly doesn't have direct access to the system's resources. We would need to pass in functions to the WebAssembly module so that it can work with the operating system. Now for Node, this will probably include a lot of the functionality of things like the C standard library and things that are part of POSIX, um, the portable operating system interface, which is an older standard and helps with compatibility across different kinds of operating systems, Unix-like operating systems. To make that happen, the Node core folks would need to figure out what API they want to use for these functions. But wouldn't it be nice if that were actually something standard? Not something that was constrained just to Node, but could be used across other runtimes and use cases too? 
a POSIX for WebAssembly, if you will, a POSIX, a portable WebAssembly system interface. And if this were done in the right way, <laughs> you could even implement the same API, but in a different way for the web. Now these functions wouldn't be part of the core WebAssembly spec, and there would be WebAssembly hosts that didn't include them. But for platforms that could make use of them, there would be a unified API for calling these functions, no matter which platform your code was running on. And this would make universal modules, ones that run across both the web and Node, so much easier. So is this something that could actually happen? Well, we and others are working on it, and I think we have a pretty good chance. And we are also seeing a lot of demand for this um, from a wide range of very different domains. One of these domains is uh, the domain of CDNs, of serverless and of cloud computing. The Fastly CDN, for example, serves a significant fraction of the entire internet's traffic. And they are moving from serving just static files, as CDNs have historically done, to running their customer's code on every incoming request. And they are doing this without adding 10 times as many machines to their network, which is really what they would have to do uh, if they were to use more traditional server architectures, where you'd use something like containers or other heavyweight mechanisms to run untrusted code. Instead, WebAssembly gives them the sandboxing they need at the speed and at the scale that they need. People are also working on building blockchain platforms with WebAssembly. There's interest in the IoT space and in writing portable CLI tools with WebAssembly. We've also seen interest from companies building game engines where WebAssembly can be used to run game logic in um, sandboxes. And with projects like WasmJIT and Nabulet, some folks try to make it run inside operating system kernels. I don't have time to explain all these different use cases and what exactly makes WebAssembly good for them, but um, there are some important considerations. For example, they all have in common that sandboxing and portability are important for them. And there are some other important commonalities which I want to talk a bit more about. For example, how do things like network access work or file access? The way these things work should ideally be roughly identical across all of these use cases, or exactly identical. If you use WebAssembly together with JavaScript in the browser or in Node, then JavaScript is used to let WebAssembly talk to the outside world. You use fetch to load a file from a server. In the browser, all of this is standardized, so you can rely on it. And you use nodes fs.read file to read a file. And you can also rely on this, but for a different reason. There's really only one runtime you would use, node. Because node is a de facto standard, you know the APIs you can use and can rely on. Ideally, we'll have a similar situation with WebAssembly where you know what APIs you can work with, but not through one runtime being completely dominant. Instead, we are working towards a standardized runtime environment, which means there'll be a set of functions that you can rely on for things like file access or network access. That means you can compile code once and run it in all of these different environments, and in any runtime that provides these functions, or in the browser where these functions can be implemented using JavaScript, using existing DOM APIs. And then you can have um, runtimes that are really tailored towards their exact use case, instead of having to rely on a one-size-fits-all. So for this standard library, we could have said, let's just use POSIX and be done with it. Unfortunately, that eliminates one of WebAssembly's big advantages. Security model, uh, its security model, and in particular, the sandboxing Lynn talked about. 
Lynn also talked about how Node had a choice to make, at least for JavaScript modules. Um, a choice between keeping the sandbox that JS runs in in the browser or giving it an easy way to talk to the outside world. And we now have the same choice to make. Do we go with this easiest route, but give up on sandboxing, or do we do something different? Something that allows better control and leads to better security and auditability. And that last point is really important. Um, if you run an application or before you run an application, ideally, you should be able to tell what it can do to your machine, sort of in the worst case. Can it access your entire file system and then just send off things to the internet, say your Bitcoin wallet? Maybe not run that machine, uh, that, that, that application, but if it can only access files in a single directory and write back to that directory, seems fine. Now with POSIX, that is incredibly hard. Um, and it really only works with support from the operating system. And how this works is different between different operating systems. So there goes a lot of your portability. Solid, portable sandboxing is hard. Back when Node was created, nobody had really figured out how to apply it to the real world. But with things such as Google's Fuchsia operating system, this has changed. Better designs exist. And for WASM time, we are working on a standard library that will make it easy to build secure, auditable, and portable modules and applications that will work for all of these different use cases. So with this standardized API, you could get the same flexibility that you have with Node, but still have security, auditability, and the ability to run your code in very different runtimes. And we are making sure that you can use the tools you are used to as well, the compilers for languages such as Rust, C, C++, and others, and the debuggers such as LLDB and GDB, and IDEs such as Xcode and Visual Studio Code. So as you can see, there's a lot of active development in this space. We are all working hard to make it easy for you to target these different use cases without making you jump through hoops to develop and debug your code. And with this, we bring these capabilities of the web that Lynn mentioned, the portability and security, and the auditability that I mentioned to all of these use cases. Now let's zoom back out and look at the skill tree. I said at the beginning of this talk that people have a misconception about WebAssembly. This idea that the WebAssembly that landed in the MVP was the final version of WebAssembly. And I think you can see now why this is a misconception. Yes, the MVP opened up a lot of opportunities. It made it possible to bring a lot of desktop applications to the web. But we still have many use cases to unlock. From heavyweight desktop applications to small modules to JavaScript frameworks to all of those things outside of the browser. Node and serverless and the blockchain and portable CLI tools and the Internet of Things. So the WebAssembly that we have today is not the end of the story. Because WebAssembly still has promise to keep and many places to go before it sleeps. I want to thank my collaborators on developing this talk, Luke Wagner and Till Schneiderite, and thank you all for listening.